Okay, let's get started, everyone. How's everyone doing? Pretty, pretty rowdy today, huh? Whoa. <laughs> All right, well, it's good to see everyone. Um, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently today. Uh, for the first 15 minutes, what we're going to do is going to cover a video uh, from Higher Things. Now, let me just make a brief mention. We had 32 to 33 youth and adults from the church that went down to Fargo for a Higher Things conference. Now, Higher Things is a registered service organization of the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate. It's an organization that helps to equip and teach youth in the Lutheran faith. And um, so what ends up happening, they have local retreats. We do a retreat here every year in March. Uh, the last couple of years we've had it, so I think the, a couple of years ago we did before COVID, we had 70, 80 people out for it. This last time we did 70, 80 people out for it, which is great to see. Um, <clears throat> now, here's the thing I always tell people that we, we don't do it for the numbers, we do it for the catechesis, so we celebrate when we do have numbers, but even if we had 15 people, it's worth doing because it's worth teaching, what, 15 people. Um, and then we had conferences, they have conferences every year. The conferences exist throughout uh, the United States. So this last year they had a conference here in Fargo. Uh, they also had a conference, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the other places. Man Michigan. Michigan. And um, Texas. Texas. And then, yeah, just those three. And Colorado, too. Yep, we had four from Colorado, yep. Yeah. So then this next year, so it'll be 2022, they have conferences. Uh, they move them around different college campuses. So, <clears throat> the summer of 2022, they have one in Bozeman, Montana. And so the idea is to take a group of youth there. Once they're on campus, it's a college campus, once they're on campus, the kids stay in dorm rooms. And then, uh, imagine waking up. Now, <laughs> adults don't always, I, I, I laugh at Amanda, because I don't know if you guys know Amanda's a go-getter. And, and she, she, she gets things done. And it was day two, I looked at her, and her face had this glossy look on it. And just like, uh, you know, are you there, Amanda? She's, and she hit the wall, which everybody hits the wall when you go to this. As an adult, you, you don't realize the pace. Uh, so you always hit the wall. So imagine coming in um, and waking up at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, eating breakfast at 8, 8 o'clock, and then going to have matins, the service of matins. Okay? We've done matins before. Be, oh, Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You have a service of matins. Then you get done, and you have a... We have a 45-minute plenary uh, where a pastor speaks for 45 minutes on the subject at hand. Then you get done, uh, you have some announcements, and then you go have lunch. And then after lunch, you go and have vespers. Oh, Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Vespers. And then when you're done with vespers, then you have breakaways throughout the afternoon. Breakaways are classes you go attend. You have different uh, pastors and presenters that will be speaking. I know President Birch was there. He spoke at one of the breakaways. And you attend these classes, and you split. Everybody on campus splits, and they go to their different classrooms to attend classes all afternoon. And then you come back, and you have, what, uh, dinner. And then after dinner, you come back in, and you have evening prayer, uh, the evening prayer service. And uh, you go through the evening prayer service, and then you have free time, which is usually going out to play games and hanging out on the campus and so forth. And then at 11, what time was Compline? 11 o'clock. You meet outside the dorm, and you sing Compline. So that's how, how many church services? Four church services. And then you go up to your dorm rooms, and you obviously talk to your friends. You don't get to bed till about, what, 12, 30, 1 o'clock. And then you wake up again at 7, and you do it all over again and again and again. And uh, so the kids go through. It's, it's a very, very... Uh, intense time of learning and teaching and also fellowship and so forth. So the kids uh, got together and they wanted to present back to you, and I think this is most appropriate, and I had really um, nothing to do with this. This was all organized with the kids and the advisors. Uh, they made a video. Um, I didn't make this video, so they did all this work. And the purpose and intent is to educate and to share with you as a church what they learned. Um, obviously because you as a church and families and uh, parents and grandparents are the ones that are giving money to this, so it's a way of showing what your money is going to. Um, I think that's a good way of, uh, of stewardship. So sit back. Uh, it's a 15-minute video. I'll crank up the volume nice and loud and put it on the system here. And uh, check it out, okay?
St. Paul's in New Jersey. This is the Higher Things uh, press conference, 2021. Okay, so I'm going to ask them some questions, and they're going to give me their answers. Okay, what was your favorite part about the conference? Uh, the breakaways, but my favorite one was uh, the serving the military for Christ and uh, country. Um, mine was also the breakaways, so my favorite one was no preaching of the Bible. Mine was also the breakaways, and it was a school that's going to go. I was also in the ways, and I think my one was invisible or indispensable. Mine was in the big ways, and I built very much in the ways, and I built very much in the ways. Mine was in the big ways, and I built very much in the 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 ways. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, 
you go to a college, so you get the experience of like a college, I can't say life because you're not living on campus all the way, but you're there you have, you can do stuff college kids would be able to do besides drinking and stuff like that. So you have freedom with some of your advisors, even though, and you still have rules, so you have to abide by the rules, but you have more freedom and you get to know fellow youth. Like, I didn't know anything like class of cars, and I found that on this trip. So, I got to know Ramsey a lot more than what I did before. So it's kind of like a bonding experience. Yeah, it's a bonding experience along with learning. That's all that I have today. Would you encourage youth to attend in 2022? I just because you can meet people that have the same faith as you. Yes, because you can meet new people that are the same age group as you and have the same faith as you. Uh, would you like to encourage youth to attend in 2022? Yes, it was very fun. It was a very great experience to uh, be with your friends and then uh, learn about God and stuff. So, yes, because it was my first time as well. Yes, it's a very good way to get away with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to encourage youth to attend in 2022? Yes, I would because it is a good place for you to get to know other Christians, other youth that have the same faith. And, oh, I have a lot of bad things. They want to have a lot of bad things. God is a good test in your gospel. I'd say yes, I encourage my youth to go because you actually get to meet new people and get to know more about people within your own church. Yes, I would encourage more people to come because you can meet new people and hang out with some of your best friends and learn at the same time. I definitely say so. It's very great experience just overall. I say yes, and you can be yourself there and you get to learn about God and hang out with friends. I say yes because it's fun.
She didn't give me clear answers. She's still figuring that out, but I'm not. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that if you imagine having a book and, you know, you have about, at uh, this conference, about 400 youth. Uh, the conference is anywhere from 400 to 1,200 youth. Um, and then you have probably, let's just say, 20, 25 different breakaways, and you have to look at them, and you look at the titles. <clears throat> it was teaching a little synopsis, and that's how you kind of choose what you want to go to. And so that was one that they were impacted. The other one was the military one. I know the boys were really impacted by the military one. Uh, and there's a couple others, so that's pretty good. Any questions? I mean, real quickly, is there any questions uh, pertaining to the, towards that since we spent a little time talking about that? Um, one question might be is if it's something that uh, it's, it's, it's designed for youth, but if you were interested in getting involved or even coming with and so forth, uh, talk to us. Uh, we had, uh, I know, some advisors that came with, but also some, at the same time, some other adults that just kind of came with for the ride, too, as well. So talk to us if you're interested um, in next year. Okay? What is the group Yeah. The, here's the one thing that's really interesting. So <clears throat> the church services that hire things, are they different than what we do here? They're the exact same. So the church services that you have hire things are the exact same church services we do here. They come straight out of the hymnal. Now, um, I, I heard one pastor one, once, once upon a time, he said, you know, hire things is kind of like Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And, and that was actually an unfortunate misunderstanding. Uh, it isn't. It's straight out of our hymnal. So what we do at Higher Things is what we do where? Here at St. Paul's. And the pastors that speak at Higher Things uh, who were the pastors that spoke at Higher Things? Mostly North Dakota pastors. So we use local pastors uh, doing church services on the hymnal. And so all it is is it's just basically like church on steroids for like four days in a row. And that's all it is. It's just church services and teaching for four days straight. So they get uh, three to four days of just intense teaching um, from the Word of God and from different pastors in church services. I think it's 12 church services over four days. So uh, it's basically, it's basically uh, in a lot of ways, vacation Bible school, uh, but like 2.0, right? Vacation Bible school for uh, high school kids. Okay? Well, but, you know, when I first started, I was not born and raised in the very same year. And I, uh, when I was in here. I, I, I'm, I'm taken back by this. I remember now, I, you guys know that I didn't come into, uh, I didn't grow up in the Missouri Senate myself. I uh, came into the Missouri Senate about eight years ago. And you know what, what really, really grabbed a hold of me was this, is when I was in Southern California, we would come into the churches. We had a church in Southern California, about 400 people a Sunday. Uh, it was anywhere from two to, yes, yeah, so depending on where it was, either two to 400 people. And um, they would come in, and I was the associate pastor of children and youth, okay? And so what happened is everybody would come in, and we would have nursery, we'd have first through third, fourth through sixth, and seventh through eighth. We had church services for all those kids. So the parents come in with all their kids, they go drop off their kids in the nursery, first, first through third, fourth through sixth, and then the junior high kids would go in the sanctuary with mom and dad. And then everybody was, what, fragmented apart, in the church service. So imagine coming to church, you say, bye kids, and everybody departs. And so the family's, what, broken apart. And then um, the junior high kids were in the service, and then all of a sudden the sermon would happen, and the junior high kids would get up and they would, what, leave to go to their own church service where you'd have um, a Sunday school teacher teaching them during the sermon. So what ended up happening to the, 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 the family during church? Was it binding together or pulling apart? It pulled them apart. Now, at the time, I thought that was really neat. And I would go from classroom to classroom, and I would give Bible lessons, little mini sermons at each of the different places. So the pastor's going to all these different spots. When I came to the Missouri Senate, uh, I was sitting in the pew in winter, Zion Lutheran winter. And at the time, Anya, gosh, how old was Anya at that time? Four years old. 
And so Serenity was sitting there, and it was Matthias, and then there was Anya. And right next to Anya was a gal named Ruth. Ruth turned 102 the other day. And Ruth was in her 90s at that time. And I saw Anya with her hymnal open, sitting next to Ruth with her hymnal open. open. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, I don't know if I, what, no, this was, I don't know when this was, I think this was before I was installed. It dawned on me. Because I was sitting in the pew, and I looked right over, and I noticed it. And so before I was installed, I was standing there just in the pew. I looked over, and I see my daughter trying to read the best she can out of the hymnal with Ruth. And then all of a sudden, they're singing, and I hear this beautiful little four-year-old voice singing. And I hear a gravelly nine-year-old voice singing the what? Same words. And it dawned on me, this is awesome. One faith, one baptism, right? And Anya was being grafted into the same faith that Ruth had been grafted into for what? 90 years. And it dawned on me the brilliance of our liturgy, the brilliance of our hymnody, the brilliance of the theology we hold to. It's something that we don't fragment. So the higher things, when they go to higher things, they're not being taught something what? Different than the older saints. They're given the same thing that you get. And so they're being grafted in the same thing that you cherish. So we have what? Not two churches or three. We have what? One church. Yeah? So I would say some of you more uh, folks in the prime time, right? The prime time of your life. Uh, you're more welcome to come. I would say the only thing is just energy keeping up might be a little bit. <laughs> right? Uh, they go to college and they get all that outside pressure. Yep. Who cares what it's better? Yep. It's, 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 uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's theology and church. It's just, it's given high impact for three, four days straight. Yep. Yep. Now, some of the questions that they were mentioning is that they had pastors up on the stage and then people were texting in messages and the pastors on the stage had to answer the questions on the spot. Uh, the questions were quite remarkable. And the questions reveal, the questions we ask reveal what we're struggling with in life. And, um, and, and you, the, a lot of the questions of the youth, uh, a lot of them were dealing with sexuality. Uh, we live in a very confusing sexual uh, time in our culture. A lot of confusion going on with sexuality. Uh, so a lot of those questions were, were, were that way. The whole theme of the conference was forgiven. So it was on confession and absolution, uh, which is the office of the keys. So that was the theme of the conference itself. Okay? Even though it was in North Dakota, we had all sorts of different states there, too. Yeah, so there's about 130 people from North Dakota, but then you have people from New York, you have people from, um, you know, uh, Montana, Minnesota, Iowa, and so forth, all over the place that gathered. Okay? All right, any other questions? Yes? If, if you go to YouTube, you can actually go to higherthings.org, higherthings.org, and you can actually access all the teaching. Um, there, there's, there's one, um, if you go to YouTube, their YouTube channel, they have, uh, and, I, and I listen to it quite often, they have the youth singing now. There was one, I'm trying to think, it was at Valparaiso University, I believe it was, where they were singing, um, um, what song was it? Um, I was back in the hymnal, 843, is it? Anyway, it was a hymn that they were singing, and they had all the youth on the orchestra playing their instruments, and then the pastors came in with a processional cross, and you had 1,200 people singing a hymn, belting it out. And I'm sorry, I'll be very honest, I'll be very blunt on this. People who say that youth don't like hymns and can't sing hymns, they don't know what they're talking about. I don't want to say that nicely. They, they just don't. They just don't know what they're talking about. And so to hear 1,200 kids sing a hymn, um, it, it just, it, it's just, it's amazing to hear the voice. And, and it gives you a sense of like, man, imagine what glory with all the saints is going to be like, right? I don't, I, I can't comprehend that to hear, you know, we hear a couple hundred voices singing a hymn here on Sunday, 1,200 voices singing a hymn of glory, um, praise to the Lord, it's, but to imagine you know, millions upon millions? Whoa. You know, it's crazy. So, yep, good question. All right, we're going to jump briefly. Um, we've, we've, we've had enough time on this, which means I don't have to prepare Bible study for next week.
which is a good thing. <laughs> so we're going to look at Acts chapter 13. I think we're going to just try to cover the first part of Acts 13. And then next week we'll cover the second part of Acts 13. Uh, but if you turn your Bibles for briefly, we'll look uh, for about 10 minutes here at Acts 13. Okay? Verses 1 through 52. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to look at the very first part of Acts, and then we'll save the second part of Acts for next week. Uh, pull out uh, English Standard Version. Let's have a word of prayer here as we jump into things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you make us always captive to your word, for your word is truth, holy truth for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Uh, now keep in mind the church is continually growing. Now the book, for those of you who... Um, I know some of the youth, um, uh, to pick you up on speed on this here too as well. Uh, Acts is the history of the church. It's the history of the church after the resurrection of Christ. And so we see in verse uh, 1 of chapter 13, it says this, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, um, Manan, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, so they're being booted out to go. So, being, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they called, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Now, we hear all of these technical words. I want us to understand something real clearly here. What is, what is phenomenal here is that we are reading technically like a history book here. This is history. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that these are real places and real times and real circumstances. So you can actually go to Cyprus and you find the town, Salamis, and that is a town's a port city. So when we see this, we're not reading mythological stories. These are what? Real people, real time, and real geographical locations. And so that should give us a, a, a degree of confidence, okay? And so we, we see these things. Now, um, oftentimes, you know, the, the secularists, the atheists, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, sometimes the Gospels aren't made up, or blah, 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 blah. And, and if you look at it, though, uh, how it's recorded, if you're going to write history, and you're going to write the Gospels in the first century, I'll give you a real small case in point. If you're going to do that to actually uh, bolster a story to get people to buy into it, you would not, now, no disrespect women, but you would not have who looking at the tomb first. You would not have women discovering the empty tomb first. You would actually have men if you're going to create a story and fabricate it. Um, you look at Peter. And you look at, at, at the Gospels, how is Peter betrayed? He denies Christ three times. Um, and so you look at that, how they portray and how they communicate. Um, if you're going to bolster it, you're going to do a lot of things that would not actually be done. That makes sense? Okay, so we have here, they're down in Cyprus. This is actually an island, okay? And when they got through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, prophet named Bar-Jesus. That's, that's his name. Okay, so you got to keep in mind that the name Jesus is also the Old Testament name of Joshua. So Joshua, Hebrew for Joshua, and in, in, this, in this time it's also Jesus. It's just a different way of pronouncing it. So there's a lot of Jesuses during that time. Not people being like Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, but there's a lot of people named Jesus at that time. Because it was coming from the derivative of Joshua. So there's this magician, there's a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the pro, uh, proconsul uh, Sergius Pallas, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, this is the our Jesus, the same guy, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and said, Get this, this is great. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And then now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, <laughs> mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Okay, so what's going on here? 
We're just going to stop there for the text there, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover the rest of Acts 13 next week. <clears throat> we'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that, yep. So in Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Paul are sent on their first missionary journey, okay? Now it would be easy to think that they were received with joy as they went out. However, as we look more closely at Acts 13, we see the exact opposite. What do we see? Conflict. Okay? In the beginning portions of Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas encountered a Roman governor named Sergius Pallas. Apparently, Sergius had some respect and connections to Judaism since he had a Jewish magician as one of his advisors. So you know how politicians, they have people who advise them? And the kind of people that they, 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 they listen to, that are kind of in their, their inner circle. And then in his inner circle, this, this Roman governor, in his inner circle, he had this magician named Bar-Jesus. Okay? So long story short, Sergius uh, wanted to hear more from Paul and Barnabas, but the heretical magician did not want this to happen. So Bar-Jesus opposed Paul and Barnabas and tried to turn Sergius away from them. Bar-Jesus opposed the message of the gospel. Okay? So, you have a Roman governor, he wants to hear more from the missionaries that are sent. He's like, I want to hear more about this, but his advisors, what? No, 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 no. You shouldn't listen to them. Okay? I'm trying to dissuade them from listening. Okay? Now, it's important to keep things in perspective. The Roman governor wanted to hear. His ears were what? Open. Paul and Barnabas were there to proclaim. But Bar-Jesus, this magician, he did not want this to happen. And so Paul denounces the heretical trickster and tells him that he will be blinded. In other words, Paul is not gentle. He's not gentle with Bar-Jesus, the magician, but firm. And listen to what he says here. Listen, okay, listen to what he says. You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. Can you imagine hearing that? You know, and you hear that, those, those are what? Those are fighting words. Those are firm words. You are a child of the devil. You're an offspring of the devil. You were conceived by the devil, and you're an enemy of everything that is right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Well, you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. So what can we learn from this? First, it is not a surprise that Paul and Barnabas were opposed in their first missionary journey. Okay, so it shouldn't surprise us, right? It shouldn't surprise us when uh, the gospel is opposed. Uh, I'll be very... I'll try to say this as, as humbly as I can, but also very bluntly. Um, we as Christians, when the gospel is opposed, we shouldn't say, oh, can you imagine? Um, that's actually rather naive. When the gospel goes forth, we should what? We should expect there to be conflict. Why? Because the gospel is light and truth, and it goes forth into a world of what? darkness and deceit. When you are baptized into the Christian faith, it is as if you are getting a big target on your back and the devil has you as what? An enemy. If you're not baptized, right? does the devil have to worry about you? If you're not a Christian, does he have to worry about you? Not really. But if you are baptized in the faith, you are a confessor of Christ, you receive the blessings of Christ, now you are a what? You have a target on your back. The devil has flaming arrows for you. And so when bad things happen to the church, uh, we should not be surprised. In fact, I would say we should be more alarmed when the church doesn't have opposition. Okay? Um, this comes back to this idea of suffering as the church. Okay? Alright, so the devil, the world, and the flesh hate the gospel. When we confess the gospel, we should expect blowback, not roses and cotton candy. Secondly, consider how Paul spoke to the evil heretic Bar-Jesus. Paul was cutting and biting. He did not sugarcoat things. He called Bar-Jesus out for what he was. He called a spade a spade. This is the exact thing that Jesus did in John 8, 44 as well. You Pharisees belong to your father, the devil. But why the harsh words? Okay, why the harsh words? Because harsh words are often needed for harsh situations. Consider Matthew 18, 6 for a moment. 2. Jesus says, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. In other words, if people, institutions, situations, and circumstances prevent people from hearing the gospel, they are evil. And if they are evil, 
We should not pretend that they are good. Okay? Um, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of, of a couple of years ago, I was online and there was a debate and I had some friends that were debating on, um, on the issue of abortion and children in the womb. And there was a, 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 a gal who was an ELCA pastor and I knew her from childhood. And she was on there arguing uh, against the pro-life stance. And um, I said to her, so she was basically arguing that. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to just quote the words of Jesus to her. So I told her, I said, um, uh, Pastor Susie, we'll call her Susie. I said, Pastor Susie, um, I said, if any of you, if you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe me, it would be better for you to have a millstone fast around your neck and drown in the depths of the sea. So I was quoting what? Jesus to her. She did not know her Bible well enough as a pastor, so she thought I was personally what? A threatening her that I was going to kill her. So, so, so she, 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 she gave a big rant. She blocked me and reported me, saying that I was threatening her life. And so, I'm like, um... He took away all his millstones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah take away my millstones, right? And so I actually got a hold of her. I found her, uh, the church that she served in, and I sent her an email. I said, I am not threatening you. Jesus is. Good day. Right? Um, why? Evil actions should have what? Harsh words, right? Uh, especially when there's unrepentance, right? Okay. So did that female pastor, does she need harsh words? You bet. Um, the fact that she thought I was threatening her is actually kind of humorous because it wasn't me, it's the words of Jesus. So she should feel the weight of Jesus on that. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, so imagine if Paul would have said to Bar Jesus, page two, Here, here, now, what you speak is probably true for you, which means we're probably saying the same thing, just using different words. Besides, we are religious people, Bar Jesus, and we should strive to get along. If people see us fighting, then they may be turned off from religion. Love must overcome hate. Can you imagine if Paul would have said that? I mean, that's what our culture says that we should be saying, rather than calling a spade a spade. So, real briefly here, alas, too often in Midwestern culture, we suffer from chronic niceness. Chronic niceness does not allow us to call evil, evil. Mark this, we actually sin when we label something good that is actually evil. Yes, we're called to put the best construction on persons and things, but we're also called to be truth speakers as Christians, which means that we must call things out as they really are. Too often the church is kind to heretical wolves in the church when the church should be cutting and biting. Oh, how pastors fail when they are gentle with wolves in the church when they should be harsh. Evil needs to be called out, especially when it is public. Now, real briefly as a way of, uh, we'll pick up on this next week. Uh, we need to keep in mind that there's a difference between a wolf and a shepherd and sheep. Okay? So... The shepherd is called to be what? Harsh on wolves or gentle with wolves? Harsh. Is the shepherd to be harsh or gentle with sheep? Gentle. Oftentimes what can happen is that, um, and I've seen this over the 18 years of being in the, in the pastor in the ministry, and myself included, I'm not immune to this, is that pastors can be harsh with sheep because they know sheep what? Won't bite back. So a pastor can be really bark really, really loud and be really boisterous around what? Little sheep. But when the wolf comes, what does the pastor do? He chickens out. Yeah, so Lord have mercy on pastors. And so there's a difference in how we treat sheep. Luther says this, that sheep need to be always treated with gentleness. Because even if a sheep is erring, he said that the erring sheep has learned that from what? A bad pastor. So we're always, always, always gentle with sheep. However, when there are wolves, what is the pastor called to do? Right? That staff that the pastor, right, the staff that a shepherd has, can be used to rescue sheep, protect sheep, but it can also be used to what? Whack wolves on the snout. Right? And so that's what is Paul doing here. What is Paul doing to bar Jesus? Is he whacking them with the shepherd's staff? You bet. Why? He was preventing who? The Roman governor from hearing about Jesus. 
Now, he didn't just block them because of, you know, difference in um, maybe a sporting event, right? Like, maybe he liked the Vikings and Paul liked the Packers and, like, smack, right? No, he smacked them because why? He was preventing what a little one from what? Hearing Jesus, hearing the gospel. Okay? That makes sense? So this goes to show us the importance of the gospel needing to be preached and proclaimed. And so we speak harshly when the gospel is impeded, right? Um, we, we speak harshly against evil when evil is evil, while at the same time putting what? The best construction when we're able to, okay? All right, we are at 1017, so I apologize for having to stop there. We're going to pick up next week on... Um, the further opposition of Paul and Barnabas later on in chapter 30, we'll review real quickly Bar Jesus next week and talk about that, how, how all chapter 13 shows the opposition to the gospel and how Paul and Barnabas struggled and wrestled with proclaiming the gospel when there's opposition. Okay? Alright, so let's stand and pray. Yes? I'm just going to mention, I do have copies of the Lord's Agenda for next week. So that's next Sunday. Um, typically we have them help Next to the newsletters, okay. by the entryway. But I will set the initial ones right here. Okay. We've got the council meeting manager over this month. That's awesome. Uh, in the agenda. Just a real quick note, thank you to the council. Uh, this is something I know Dana as our chairman and everybody has been working on is to get those meeting minutes out ahead of time. So thank you to the council. Great council guys to get that stuff out to you ahead of time so you can review it. So yeah, grab a hold of it and check it out before the meeting. It's wonderful. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> say hi. I think Papa and Grandma are watching. Say hi, Papa and Grandma. Hi, Papa and Grandma. Say hi, Lisa. Lisa, say hi. hi.